Yahweh shows his power to save Israel as he uses a small force to defeat an army of 135,000. And Gideon the judge leads the people to victory on The Bible Brief. Have you donated to the Bible Literacy Foundation? We'd love for you to become a part of the Bible Lit team as we make Bible learning content. Want to donate today? Check out the link in the show notes. Israel is in crisis on all fronts. The 40 years of rest achieved by God through Deborah, Barak, and Jael had quickly come to an end. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. God had already delivered them generation after generation from their enemies in the land. But after this period of rest, these Israelites continued to turn away from God. It seems that with every new generation, new rebellion arises, and the parents failed to stop it. There was both a failure of leadership by the older generations and a failure of faithfulness by the nation at large. With few exceptions, parents failed to teach their children all that God had done for the nation as the law of Moses required. Despite God sending judges to save his people, they continued to rebel. As a result, Israel is in crisis. The Midianites, formerly decimated by Israel before they entered the land, had regained their strength and swooped into the land of Canaan to dominate Israel. God was using this external nation to chasten his people, to let them see that all the other false gods would fail the nation. Only Yahweh, the one true God, the God who remembered his promises and brought the people out of Egypt, only Yahweh could save them. The Midianites were severely oppressing Israel. It was bad. The Israelites would plant and cultivate crops, but as soon as harvest came, the Midianites would come to devour the produce. The Israelites would raise livestock, but the Midianites would steal it. When the Midianites came into the land, they laid waste everything that the Israelites had tried to accomplish agriculturally. And not only that, but the Israelites couldn't even live in the open country. They were so defeated that they had to live in caves and dens in the mountains. It's in this context that the people of Israel cry out for help to Yahweh. And despite the people's disobedience and worshiping other gods, Yahweh responds. We read this in Judges, chapter 6, starting in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. The end of this conversation between the Lord and Gideon contains a familiar refrain that we've heard before in the Bible. It's God saying this, I will be with you. Perhaps most notably, we heard this at the initial commissioning of both Moses and Joshua. Back when Moses saw the burning bush and questioned his qualifications to lead the nation of Israel, God said, I will be with you. When Joshua was about to lead the nation to conquer the land, God said, Be strong and courageous. I will be with you. And here with Gideon, God says those same words, I will be with you. Yet what should have perhaps been encouraging words to Gideon are met with some doubt. Gideon seeks to test God, to apparently make sure that he's not just speaking to some random guy under a terebinth tree. God graciously allows for this test, and when Gideon brings some meat and cakes to the angel of the Lord, fire comes out of a rock to consume the meal. An incredible display of power confirming that Gideon is indeed speaking to Yahweh. After this test, later in the evening, 
God commands his first action from his chosen deliverer for Israel. He says to Gideon, Take your father's bull, and the second bull seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to Yahweh your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Apparently for Gideon, even the presence of God didn't assuage fears of his family in town. So in the dead of night, he obeys God's command to destroy the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah pole before building an altar to Yahweh. His secretive mission was a success, but it didn't remain secret for long. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down, and the second bowl was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon the son of Joash has done this thing. And the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for Baal shall be put to death by morning. If Baal is a god, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubbaal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. The men of the town are upset that Gideon has destroyed their worship implements for Baal and Asherah, and they want Gideon's blood. But Gideon's father does something that perhaps Gideon himself didn't expect. Joash stands up for his son and challenges Baal himself to defeat Gideon. In fact, Joash threatens that if anyone tries to avenge Baal by going after Gideon, that that man would be swiftly put to death. If Baal is a god, then Joash says, let him contend for himself. And perhaps needless to say, Gideon didn't die that day or any time soon by Baal. False gods tend to have trouble avenging themselves. But Gideon did earn a nickname that day. He would also be called Jerubbaal, a name meaning, let Baal contend against him. Gideon had tested God to ensure that his call on Gideon was real. And now God had tested Gideon to see if he would be faithful to God's command. The call was real and the obedience was real. And Gideon's next mission would be much grander. He would go out in God's power to defeat the Midian raiders. It was time to muster Israel's forces against this external threat. Next we read this. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Gideon, empowered by the Spirit of the Lord, is able to get three other tribes of Israel to gather against the encamped Midianite coalition. Apparently, this must have occurred around harvest time in Israel, because that was the time of the usual Midianite raids on the crops and livestock of Israel. This coalition of outsiders was in a large valley. The same valley, in fact, where Sisera's chariots had faced the army of Barak just a generation prior. But lest we think the battle is about to start, Gideon, reluctant yet again, decides to test God again. He wants to make sure that God will indeed grant victory to the four tribes that he's assembled. This time the test involves fleece that's wet or dry despite the opposing conditions on the surrounding ground. The result of this test is again God confirming his call and his empowering of Gideon. But it would be God's turn for a test again. Would Gideon go out to battle with only a fraction of the army that he had mustered? In chapter 7, verse 2, we read this. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, 
let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned home, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. And let all the others go every man to his home. Through a few methods of selection, God has reduced Gideon's army from 32,000 to only 300. That's a reduction of 99%. Gideon had mustered four tribes worth of soldiers, but God only wanted 300. It's apparent that God's making a point here. Victory in battle has nothing to do with numbers, or strength, or horses, or chariots. Victory in battle has only one requirement, the presence of God. When God is with an army, it cannot fail. Yahweh would show his strength to his straying nation through only 300 men against a Midianite coalition of 135,000. The men of Israel would be outnumbered 450 to 1. But the Midianites would be outnumbered too. Israel had the one true living God, while the Midianites had zero. Let's see which of these number comparisons matters more. After paring down the army to 300, God then gives a new command to Gideon, a command with two options. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are too afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. God is treating Gideon gently and graciously. He effectively says, Do what I say, but if you're too afraid, go spy on the enemy camp and listen, and what you hear will encourage you. And Gideon, for his part, is afraid, so he takes option two. Soon he and his servant go to the camp of the Midianites and overhear the dream of someone in the camp who dreams that Gideon will defeat the Midianites. You can understand that Gideon would then be encouraged to hatch a plan with his men back at the Israelite camp. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and put trumpets into the hands of all of them, and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. This must have been something for one of those 300 men to hear. They were going to defeat the Midianites with what? With trumpets and torches? It surely took the faith of each of these 300 men to even stay with Gideon and go along with this plan. A plan that soon put into action. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch of the night. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke their jars. They held in their left hand the torches, and in their right hand trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the Midianite army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every Midianite man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Through Gideon, Yahweh is giving his people victory. The apparent surprise attack in the middle of the night caused the Midianite coalition to be thrown into confusion and draw swords on one another to hack each other down. In the midst of this panic, God was having the Midianites defeat themselves. And before long, the army begins to break apart and flee from Israel in its confusion. By the end of the battle, the 135,000 army of Midian has been reduced to 15,000. The regional power had been decimated. Through Gideon, God had saved his people once again. He demonstrated again that apart from him, 
they will only experience devastation. But when Yahweh is with his people, the nation can only succeed. You'd hope that this would be the beginning of a great spiritual revival in the nation, that they would turn back to Yahweh and worship him alone. But it isn't so. Almost as soon as the battle is over, Gideon, the judge empowered by God to save Israel, creates a new kind of idol that the nation whores after. Despite Gideon's fear of his family, fear of his town, and fear of the Midianite army, he apparently never learned to fear Yahweh in the same way. He had delivered the nation, but caused his own downfall by creating an idol. The cycle of the judges continues, and God continues to show his power to save his rebellious nation. Will his nation ever learn? Join us next time as we meet the strongest Israelite who's ever lived. A man strong enough to defeat any enemy, yet weak enough to fall for almost any woman. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.